Hi, I'm Miguel, and I want to share a story with you all about an important leader in the Filipino-American community. I'm just going to be reading a small bit of his life story, and he was a hero, a farm leader, an activist that just wanted to fight for what he thought was right and to look out for those who are vulnerable and in need of better working conditions. Today, I'm going to be reading Journey for Justice, The Life of Larry Itliong, written by Don Mabalan, Dr. Don Mabalan, with Gail Romasanta, and illustrated by Andre Sabayan. Our two authors here were two passionate Filipino-American community leaders um, that were academics and really wanted to help create a children's book to highlight some of the important aspects of Filipino-American history uh, so that our next generation of young people are aware of our community's contributions in the state as well as this country. And as you can see here, I'm reading on an iPad here, and here is our cover with Larry brandishing his famous sunglasses. Modesto Dulay Itliong was born on October 25th, 1913, to Francisca and Artemio Itliong. Modesto, who was given the nickname Larry, was born in the Philippines in a village called San Nicolas. He was born during typhoon season, a time of heavy rains and wind. San Nicolas was a small but beautiful town surrounded by rice fields, coconut and palm trees, green mountains, rivers, and waterfalls. The village was in Pangasinan province, which is another word for region, on the island of Luzon, the largest island in the Philippines, a nation in the Pacific Ocean made up of more than 7,641 islands. That's a lot. Larry spent his childhood playing and working with his three brothers and two sisters. He loved to play baseball. All the villagers knew Larry to be funny, confident, and friendly. And what are some of your favorite activities at home? And as you can see here, uh, Larry with his mother and the village that he grew up in. Like many others in San Nicolas, Larry's parents were poor farmers who had little education. There wasn't even a school, a high school in the village. Larry only attended school until the sixth grade. At the time, the Philippines was a colony of the United States and the U.S. controlled the island nation's schools, government, military, and economy. All schools were taught in English, and if Larry tried to speak in Ilocano, the language he spoke at home, the teachers punished him by hitting his hands with a ruler, or worse. Larry's teachers praised the United States as the best, most beautiful, and modern country in the world. Larry and his friends dreamed of going to America to see it with their own eyes. Larry's neighbor was one of the thousands of workers who left the Philippines to work in the sugar plantations and farms of Hawaii and the United States. These farms and plantations needed laborers and Filipinos traveled to the U.S. to work and study. The neighbor wrote letters to Larry to brag about his adventures. Schools are good here, Larry's neighbor wrote. You can finish high school and college very quickly. Larry liked the sound of that. And here's the neighbor writing letters. In school, Larry learned about abogados, attorneys, also called lawyers, who helped people with their problems. Some lawyers were rich and powerful people who represented his province in the Philippine legislature as the politicians and the leaders in the community. Larry imagined himself debating with others and helping poor people. I want to be like that, he thought. He imagined himself with a briefcase, wearing a suit and a beautiful wool fedora, just like he saw in the photos that his neighbors and villagers sent from the United States. He could study to become a lawyer in the United States. In his American textbooks, Larry read that everyone had equal opportunities for success in America. And here is a gentleman in a dashing suit and a fedora hat. I think it's still pretty stylish today. Before Larry left, he visited his very good friend, a classmate he liked and told her that he was leaving for America. 
She burst into tears. All the boys in the village are leaving to study and work in America. I want to go too, but my papa won't let me travel so far alone, she said. My papa didn't want me to go either, but I told him I'm going to school. I'll be back in a few years as a lawyer and we can get married, Larry said. That means when you're back, we'll both have our degrees. I'm going to college in Manila, the capital, so I can be a teacher, she exclaimed. You mean it, Larry? You'll come back, she asked. Larry nodded. I'll be back, he promised. Until then, I'll write you letters. They looked at each other with hope. Larry said the rest of his goodbyes to his family and friends in San Nicolas and traveled to Manila, where he bought a ticket to travel on the steamship Empress of Asia. All the money he had in the world, $50, he put deep in his pocket for safekeeping. He boarded the ship with hundreds of other young Filipinas and Filipinos. He quickly realized that at age 15, he was the youngest passenger on the entire ship. Could you imagine going on a ship alone as a 15-year-old? He found some older boys from San Nicolas and they talked far into the night. Would they see snow and tall buildings? Would they find gold coins on the ground like their teachers had told them? What would they study in college? During the day, they went up on the ship's deck and met fellow passengers from all over the Philippines. Everyone was bursting with happiness and anticipation that they were hopeful that they were waiting for something, looking forward to something. I'm going to be a lawyer, Larry bragged. I'm going to Columbia University in New York City to become a nurse, like my cousin, one Filipino woman said. She showed everyone the creased photo of her smiling cousin. Here is the boat that everyone was on and the photo of um, the cousin that that young woman was talking about, her photo. The trip took 22 days. Wow. When Larry landed in Seattle, Washington, it was gray, drizzly, and cold. He had never felt such chilly air before. He gazed with wonder at the buildings surrounded by mountains, trees, and snow-topped Mount Rainier. One of his uncles lived in Seattle and met him at the pier. Let's go meet other Pinoys. Pinoys, that's the nickname for Filipinos in America, his uncle said. Do you have any money, he asked. I'm out of work and I could use $5 for food and rent. He took Larry to King Street in Chinatown in downtown Seattle to make new friends and eat Filipino food. As they approached King Street, Larry saw hundreds of Filipinos in stylish suits, hanging out on the sidewalks and talking loudly in many Filipino languages and in English. He heard one man speaking in Locano, so he introduced himself. We're Alasqueros, workers in the salmon canneries in Alaska, the young man told him. We're waiting for the season to start. After the cannery season, we go up and down California, throughout Washington, and even to Montana, harvesting fruits and vegetables. They were covering a lot of ground. One of the older men showed Larry his rough, calloused hands. Calluses are, uh, you know, dry dryness on your hands because of a lot of work that it's being done. We harvest grapes, onions, tomatoes, asparagus, potatoes, peaches, lettuce, celery, and more, he said. The work is so hard and my back always hurts, but I send money home to my family so they can live a better life in the Philippines. Larry walked farther down King Street where he met another Ilocano. I attended the University of Washington and studied to become a lawyer, he said, but I had to quit to earn money. We all work in canneries, restaurants, as house cleaners or servants, if you have brown skin, you can't get any other kind of job. He told Larry that he and others from his town in the Philippines put together what little money they had to buy food and rent a small apartment. Larry felt like he was punched in the gut. He thought, this is life in America? And here you can see Filipinos walking all around King Street in downtown Seattle, everyone getting together. After two weeks in Seattle, Larry heard that a farmer in Monta Montana needed workers to harvest sugar beets. He said goodbye to his uncle and hopped on a train to Montana. There, 
Larry woke up before dawn and worked with a crew of Filipinos who hunched over the land for hours under a relentless sun during the day and in freezing wind at night. They worked with no breaks, toilets, or clean drinking water, and they slept in old barns and dusty bunkhouses with dirt floors. Larry's back and knees ached, and his sore muscles made him toss and turn at night. He had to wear a wide-brimmed hat, long sleeves, and boots for protection from the sun and dust. He sometimes worked 12 hours or more a day and had no days off. The hours the farmers also used poisonous chemicals called pesticides on the crops to kill the insects that damaged the crops, but the pesticides also hurt the workers. After the lettuce season was over, Larry found a job on the railroad in Montana. One day, while he was riding the train, he realized that he missed his stop. With the train going full speed, Larry jumped off, but his right pinky finger got caught in the train door. He lost a lot of blood and stayed in the hospital for three months. His fingers were so damaged that the doctor had to amputate or surgically remove three fingers on his right hand. Here is Larry and along with other workers in the fields. And on the bottom, you can see Larry jumping off the train before he unfortunately lost his fingers in an accident. After Larry healed, his friends in the United States gave him a new nickname, Seven Fingers. He knew they were only teasing him and he thought it was funny. He wrote a letter to his family about the accident and he looked for a new job. Larry's father wrote back and suggested that he could go to college in Manila and live with an uncle there. Larry wondered what his former classmates would think of him. He left for America with big hopes, only to come home with nothing. Even worse, he would return with three fewer fingers. Larry wrote back right away, No, I came here of my own free will, and if I can't lick this problem by myself, then I am nobody, he wrote. Larry returned to Washington, where he got a job as a janitor at the Fry Lettuce Farm for 12 cents an hour. Every day, Larry watched the Filipino workers stooped low and moving quickly, row after row, cutting the heads of lettuce from the roots in the earth for 10 cents an hour. And here you can see the workers um, getting the lettuce and for not that much money. On the farm, the white workers received 10 cents an hour for an easier job. They washed and packed lettuce into boxes in a nearby shed, preparing them to be shipped all over the nation. Soon, the white workers demanded a 10 cent raise. When the bosses said no, the white workers went on strike. A strike is when all workers agree to stop working. Together, they demand a higher wage and better working conditions. If the employer agrees to workers' demands, the strike ends and the workers return to work. The shed workers asked the Filipinos to join them in the strike and promised the Filipinos that they would not go back to work unless everyone got a raise. The Filipinos agreed, and the next day, more than 500 Filipino workers demanded a five-cent raise. Until they got it, they refused to work. Larry joined the strike too. Why are you going on strike? You work inside, the super superintendent shouted. Larry responded, these are my people. If I stay here in the office, I would be a chicken. After three weeks of the strike, the employer, Fry Lettuce Farm, gave the white workers a 10 cent raise and they returned to work. The Filipinos did not receive a raise. Larry felt angry. We only asked for five cents, he thought. He and other Filipinos felt betrayed. And even worse, despite their promises to the Filipino workers to stand in unity with them, the shed workers found scabs or replacement workers for the Filipinos who went on strike and all the Filipinos lost their jobs. Another word for, for scabs is strike breaker. If employers have a replacement workers, they don't have to agree to the, de to the demands of those who are on strike and then the strike is broken. This experience taught Larry an important lesson. All workers had to be unified in their fight for justice. And here is Larry talking uh, to the superintendent. And then we also have some of the cannery workers, the Alasqueros. And that's all that I will be sharing today. And I hope that you enjoyed the story. 
Um, thank you so much.